Hi, my name is Phil and I'm a senior lecturer in astrophysics at the University of Lincoln. And I want to use this video to kind of have a look at my most interesting moons. They're my moons that I think are the most interesting. They're not necessarily the biggest moons in the solar system, the smallest. They are, in my opinion, the most interesting dynamically. So it might be because of their orbit or some things that they're doing or interacting with other things. Now, before I get there, if you're interested in these videos, you like them or they're helpful for you, then do consider becoming a member. I do have lots of videos actually in the member section that are not available to the public yet. And there's other benefits as well. So if you're interested in that, then do consider becoming a member. So our first moon then is Triton. Now Triton is a moon of Neptune and it's quite a large moon actually, but there's some very interesting things happening there which are different to other moons. So this is Neptune's largest moon. Now Triton is actually bigger than Pluto. It has an atmosphere. Now actually Pluto and Triton both have atmospheres, but Triton is slightly bigger. And they're pretty much the same object in like the composition wise, the surface structure, they're kind of almost one and the same. So if Triton wasn't a moon of Neptune, then it actually would be a dwarf planet just like Pluto. It's not big enough to actually be a planet, but it did originate where Pluto came from as well. So it's pretty much like a, almost like a sibling of Pluto, I suppose. But instead of being in the Kuiper belt where Pluto is, it's orbiting Neptune. So if we kind of zoom out from the solar system, we can see the Kuiper belt, which is this disc-like objects of smaller objects like asteroids, things like that, beyond Neptune's orbit. We've got the New Horizons spacecraft there and Voyage and all the other ones which have gone actually beyond that. And Pluto kind of resides in the Kuiper belt, kind of almost towards the inner edge. Really. So it's still on the outside of Neptune's orbit, just about, although it goes kind of across. And Triton actually originated from the Kuiper belt as well as Pluto. So Triton would have been there along with Pluto at some point in the past. Now, Pluto and its moon Charon are a binary or double dwarf planet, or pretty much. I mean, they're not exactly the same size, but they are quite close. So they orbit a common centre of mass. It's not really a small moon of Pluto. They're pretty close in size or mass. So they kind of orbit around a common centre of mass. Now, binaries are very common in the Kuiper belt. So far out from the sun in the outer parts of the solar system where the gravitational influence of the sun is less, binaries are quite common because they don't get that disruption from the gravitational interaction of the more massive objects at the centre. So binaries are common in this, in this particular location. Now it's thought that Neptune captured Triton. So again, it was a, an object like Pluto, but it got too close to Neptune and it was gravitationally captured by the planet. But here's the interesting bit. It could actually have been a binary dwarf planet just like Pluto. So it was in that kind of binary system. The pair of them came too close to Neptune. One of those was captured by Neptune and the other one was then ejected out probably back into the Kuiper belt or maybe just onto another orbit around the sun, but it, it basically left the system. So now we're left with a moon orbiting Neptune that did used to be a dwarf planet, but because it orbits a planet, it now becomes a moon. So the thing with the moon, it's not necessarily on its size. If you were to have a moon that orbited the sun, then it would be a dwarf planet or a planet. But if you put that same object in orbit around a planet, it becomes a moon. So we could put Earth in orbit around Jupiter and then Earth would become a moon, despite it being exactly the same size, mass, composition as it is now. It's about its orbit, essentially. So we've now got this object here. Now, this particular capture, in order for it to work, is likely going to be quite gentle and brief. So, again, it came fairly close by within the hill sphere of Neptune, which is the gravitational influence of Neptune. One of those was captured. One was ejected. Conservation of your energy laws basically means that that one's bound to Neptune and the other one is then ejected out with slightly different energy. So we now got this, well, yeah, this dwarf planet orbiting Neptune. And because of that, 
Um, it doesn't actually require any collisions with existing moons. So what you could get is an object coming in, hitting another moon or two moons colliding, a dwarf planet hitting another one. You then get a debris disk forming and then that debris disk kind of coalesces and you get a moon forming from that, which is how we think quite a lot of the planets and moons form. So how we think the moon might have formed around Earth. But with this one here, we expect it to be a non-collisional capture. So it came in and it was captured in its entirety. There was no collisions in the process. Now, interestingly, Triton is the largest captured moon. So captured moons are not rare. Jupiter, Saturn, they all have them. In fact, actually, Earth does have some captured moons as well, but that's a, a story for another day. And it's got an atmosphere. So it's the largest captured moon in the solar system, has an atmosphere, and it orbits the wrong way. And the wrong way we would call that retrograde. So it's orbiting backwards in respect to Neptune's spin. Now, normally when moons form with the planet, they will orbit the same way due to your conservation of angular momentum. They will typically go the same way. You can alter them from that point, but at the formation process, then they would go the same way. So the fact that it's going the wrong way around in comparison to all its other moons and the rotation of Neptune is obviously quite unique and very interesting for such a large object with an atmosphere as well. So all of its other moons are going the normal way or prograde, basically. Well, not necessarily all of them, but the main other moons that are closer in are going the right way around, whereas Triton goes this opposite way like this. Again, makes it quite unique, at least dynamically. So that was the first one. And I quite like that one. It's a large moon captured. Now, the second one means probably a little bit more to me because I spent a lot of my PhD looking at this particular moon and how it interacted with Saturn's rings. And dynamically, it's very interesting, exciting, at least for me. So this is Saturn's moon Prometheus. And it sits kind of just outside of the, or it should say inside of the F ring. So the F ring, well, I've not actually noted it here, it's that narrow ring just on the outside of the green arrow. So it's a potato moon, I say potato moon, it's a potato shaped, it's quite a small moon. And because it's small, it hasn't actually got enough gravitational force on itself, self gravity to actually mold it into a spherical shape. Once you get big enough, they kind of mold themselves into a more sphere, which I've got a video on, um, which you can have a look at instead. So it actually orbits between the outer A ring, noted there in the yellow, and the, on the inside of the narrow F ring. So it orbits in that narrow space there, which again is quite interesting because, well, why is it interesting for Saturn's rings? Well, the rings themselves are thought to be relatively short lived, or any planetary ring is thought to be. They will naturally grow into moons or coalesce, and then they will essentially dissipate. So the fact that we've got rings there and we've got a moon pretty much in the rings is also very interesting. Why is it there? Now, the interesting part is how it interacts with these rings. So again, we've zoomed in a little bit more and that's an actual image of Prometheus there. These are all taken by the Cassini spacecraft, by the way, which is obviously doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately. So again, we've got that narrow F ring, the edge of the A ring. And if you look at the F ring now, you can see there's quite a bit of structure there. You've got kind of bands there. And it's not the same all the way through. So it's not symmetric. And that is due to, at least a, a significant part of that is due to Prometheus. So what does it actually do? Well, it has an elliptical orbit. And that means that it creates this spiraling motion as it's orbiting in between the A ring and the F ring. So if you think about an elliptical orbit, that means it's gonna get closer to Saturn and then further away as it goes on one orbit. Now, if you know your Keplerian laws, so that basically means if you're closer to Saturn, it has a faster orbital velocity, shorter orbital period. So it's actually orbiting faster than the F ring. So each time it does an orbit, it advances a little bit for, more forward. And because it's elliptical, 
it will get closer to Saturn than further away. So what it actually does is it creates this spiraling motion, which you can see with the red spiral there. So it goes towards the F ring and back out again. And this is very important for the interaction that it has with the F ring. So what it does is it gravitationally stirs up the F ring. So it goes towards the F ring and then the gravitational attraction of Prometheus attracts smaller particles in the F ring. Because probably something I haven't mentioned actually is the rings of Saturn are a collection of smaller particles or even think about it as very small moons. So these can be micron size up to tens of meters in size, but the F ring is typically fairly small particles. So think of like grains of sand really. So when Prometheus goes in towards the F ring, it gravitationally attracts the nearest stuff in there and then it moves back out again and it pulls some of that out with it. So it essentially gravitationally stirs up the F ring. And I mean, this doesn't probably make a lot of sense, but each one of those lines, those channels is one of those interactions it's had and then it's advanced along. So this is the F ring that's been flattened and you can see those features. Now what I've done here is I've highlighted some fans. Now, fans are features in the F ring that are created by even smaller moons, what we would call moonlets, and they themselves have elliptical orbits, but they're actually in the F ring. So they do exactly the same thing, but on a much smaller scale. So you can see with the yellow highlighted bits, you've got these fan-like structures, and that's from moonlets in the F ring. Now, Prometheus is known to create gravitational instability in the F ring, which means that what it's doing is it's actually causing a gravitational collapse in the F ring as it's doing this stirring up. That gravitational collapse then grows into a, like a mini moon, a new moonlet. That then, well, that new moonlet then creates its own feature. So the interesting and exciting bit for me with Prometheus is that it actually creates new moons due to its interaction with the F ring and those the, well, those new moons then create their own features themselves. So you've got a moon creating moons and we can watch that almost in real time or we, we used to be able to with the Cassini spacecraft. So that for me means a lot to me because well I did my PhD modeling that and looking at those images so I find that one quite interesting. Now my moon number three is Saturn's moon Enceladus. Enceladus you've probably heard of. It's one of the moons in the solar system that we think might have the potential to support life. It may even already have life there. So this is a moon orbiting Saturn, much further out than what Prometheus is, much bigger as well. This time around it's actually spherical. So first, Enceladus is tidally locked. Okay, so it means that this, the same face of that moon is always facing towards Saturn. That's the same as our moon. So it rotates once on its axis for one orbital period. So the time it takes to go round Saturn is exactly the same time it takes to rotate on its axis. So we call that tidally locked. So it's always facing the same way towards Saturn. Okay. Now, the interesting thing here is it kind of oscillates in rotation. So if we were looking at this moon from Saturn, it appears to rock. It rocks back and forth, it oscillates in this rotation. And normally that hints at an internal ocean. So we know that the surface is frozen. You can see the images here, actually, they've got cracks on that. We know it's a frozen surface. What we can't directly image is the ocean. But this oscillation in rotation usually hints that it's got a global internal ocean that we can't see. Now, why is it rocking? Well, its orbit is not perfectly circular. It's slightly elliptical. I mean, this is a massive exaggeration here. It's tidally locked, so it should always have the same face facing towards Saturn. However, because it's elliptical, and again, going back to your Keplerian laws, if you can remember those, the orbital velocity during one orbit, if it's elliptical, is not constant. So when it's actually closer to Saturn, it will orbit faster. When it's further away, it will orbit slower. 
Now, this causes the moon to speed up and slow down on its orbit, and that affects this tidal locking. Well, it doesn't necessarily affect the tidal locking, but the rotation period can't speed up and slow down fast enough to compensate for its speed on its orbit. So what that actually does is if you've got liquid internals, it means that the surface and the liquid inside don't respond the same to speeding up, slowing down. So it kind of wobbles a bit. There's kind of a delay between the liquid internals and the solid surface. So it wobbles a bit more than if it was a completely solid object. So that is one indication that tells us it's got this global ocean. It's due to kind of the, the dynamics on its orbit. You can also work out the internal structure from gravitational perturbations of a orbit of a spacecraft, basically. So if you have an, a spacecraft and it orbits around the moon or go, it goes close by, if it's got a slightly different composition inside, then the gravitational force changes ever so slightly, which changes the orbit very slightly. So a perfect orbit with no perturbations from variations internal would be like the green line but if it's slightly different then it deviates away and we can calculate the internal structure from that probably a good example to give you is if we have a, a satellite orbit here over earth and as it goes over a mountain range there's more mass there slightly more gravity than if it was a flat plane at sea level so same idea there. If it's an uneven surface, you can work out, you know, the gravitational force from that or the gravitational field. So you can do it from spacecraft and orbits. But anyway, going back to the global ocean, if we think it's got a global ocean, then it's potentially habitable, which makes it obviously a very interesting moon in its own right. But we have these water ice plumes. So again, taken by Cassini, you can see these plumes being sent out into space. We originally thought, are oh, they coming from these oceans underneath? But it isn't necessarily the case. They don't have to originate from the surface. It's not, not, sorry, not the surface, the actual ocean below the surface. Now, the actual crust of this or the surface of this moon is quite thick. So you're talking kilometers thick ice and they might not originate from the ocean but it could come from its actual really thick ice sheet instead now why would that be the case well it gets hit by objects asteroids things like that which created the surface here's an image of one actually which is about two kilometer in diameter it's probably a bit more than that actually you can see in the center of this image taken by cassini that there's a crater which has melted the ice so an impact has hit it melted the ice Okay, that's fine. But what also does that, that mean? Well, it's kind of a salty ice or salty. It's a, it's a brine, basically. So what happens is it melts the surface and then this migrates in the crust, in the, in the actual surface. It then refreezes, but then it also causes it to become pressurized as well. So it partially freezes and then there's some liquid still in there, which becomes pressurized. That then breaks out into the surface as these plumes that we see so you don't necessarily have to have a global ocean to have these plumes but we do suspect it does have a global ocean due to that rocking motion from the dynamics of its orbit anyway now this particular moon has lots and lots of interesting things going off and one other thing i want to mention as well is that these plumes become charged so the particles being emitted from this these ice plumes are charged they become ionized and because of that they actually then follow the magnetic field line of saturn so saturn's got quite a significant magnetic field more so than earth and those charged ionized particles given out by the plume follow those field lines they then yeah basically track them out and they then end up at the poles on saturn so you've got this almost electrical circuit between the moon and saturn so yeah it creates this electric circuit between the moon and saturn so what does that actually do well it does something quite interesting actually it creates as it creates an auroral spot so we know we have the aurora on earth we have the northern and southern lights 
caused by the solar wind, which actually, if you look here, this is looking at the polar region of Saturn. And the ring is the normal aurora from the solar wind, which we get on Earth. And lots of other planets have the same one. But there is in that white box a small spot. And that is that uh, electrical circuit being created between the moon and Saturn. So those charged particles are flowing onto this auroral spot on Saturn's pole. And as the moon goes around Saturn, that auroral spot will also wander about as well. So that's another very interesting thing about this moon Enceladus. Now, on to my fourth interesting moon or dynamically interesting moon. And you're going to notice here, this is not a moon, it's moons. And this comes as a collection, basically, because it's an interesting system. So we have Dione, which is the largest one. You've got Polyducers and you've got Helene. And I apologise if I get the pronunciation wrong of these moons and the next ones in my, in my fifth set of moons, actually. I'm not that great at that. So you've got these three moons here. And the reason why they're dynamically interesting, at least for me, is that they are what we would classify as Trojan moons. They're co-orbital. So you have Dione, which is a large moon. It's spherical, as you can see. But then the other two moons, which are quite small, so 36 kilometres and 3 kilometres, very small, they sit on the same orbit as the bigger one, but they sit ahead of and behind it by around about 60 degrees. And they sit at the L4 and L5 Lagrange points. Now, what are those? What are the Lagrange points? Well, Lagrange points, again, I've done some separate videos on these, but just to recap, if you haven't come across them before, if you have a two body problem, so in this case here, it would be Saturn and then it's large moon Dione, there are five locations in and around that configuration where you can place a third negligible mass or object where the gravitational forces of the two larger masses, so the Moon and Saturn, match the centrifugal force required to orbit with the same orbital period. Basically, they're parking spots for other stuff, for smaller objects, and we do put our own spacecraft in those. So this is what it would visually look like. Again, it's not to scale. You've got L1, L2, L3. They're in a line between Saturn and the Moon. L1 is in between Saturn and the Moon. L2 is, is on the opposite side. L3 is 180 degrees all the way around. And it's where the gravitational forces and your dynamic forces basically balance. Now, L4 and L5 are 60, 60 degrees in front and 60 degrees behind the orbit of the moon. And they're the ones we're interested in here. So why are they interesting? Well, they're stable. L1, L2, L3 are not stable. You can put a spacecraft there or a moon, and they do kind of balance out. But the L4, L5 are stable. The other three are not. If they, if they were to slightly move away from those points, then they would just well, not, yeah, not accelerate, but they would not come back to the point. L4 and L5 are stable because objects there will actually orbit that point. And what that does is it creates very unusual tadpole orbits. So whilst the larger moon is going around Saturn, you've got the two smaller moons that are approximately 60 degrees in front and behind the main moon, but they themselves are doing little orbits around these points. And we call those tadpole orbits because they make like little tadpole shaped orbits. And to be honest, I haven't drawn it particularly well here because it's quite hard to draw a tadpole shape. So I've just illustrated with these kind of elliptical orbits, but they do more of a tadpole shape orbit instead. Now, it's not the only one. Now, I said this was my number four interesting moon, but actually there's another set of moons doing exactly the same thing around Saturn. And this is uh, Thesis, Telisto, and Calypso. And they have the exact same configuration. Again, two smaller moons that are co-orbital with the bigger moon. So you've got two sets of Trojan moons or co-orbital moons around Saturn. It makes Saturn a very interesting and dynamic place if you're a moon or even a ring. Now on to my final moon. And again, this comes as a pair. 
because the way they actually interact. Now, I'm going to absolutely get the pronunciation wrong here, but we've got Janice and Epimethus, I believe. Again, if I've got it wrong, just let me know. So you've got these two small moons, again, around Saturn. Now, they're both small, so around about 180, 120 kilometers in size. They're still very small. They're not big enough to be spherical like the bigger moons. And there's some images again taken by Cassini. So what's interesting about these two moons? Well, their orbits are very close to each other. So they have very similar semi-major axis. Now what happens here, again, going back to your Keplerian laws, the inner moon here, whichever one that is at the time, will orbit slightly faster than the, than the outer one. That means that it's actually going to overtake it. So overtake it on the inside. And because the orbits are very, very close, they pass extremely close to each other. So those moons pass by very close to each other. What that does is the smallest of those two moons gets its orbit deviated the most. So the smaller moon, I mean, um, I don't know whether scattering is the right word because scattering suggests it's been flung out but it slightly alters the orbits of both moons. One of those, the outer one, is pulled slightly inwards, and then the smaller one, or the, so the inner one, would do the opposite. So they kind of basically go, one goes in, one goes out. So they, they actually swap orbits as they pass, and they switch around. And once they've switched places, it starts all over again. And then the inner one would slightly catch up and overtake. And as they pass by one another, then their gravitational force, again, slightly switches their, well, it doesn't slightly switch, it switches their orbits around again because they pass so close. So these two basically just swap orbits periodically. That makes them very interesting, quite unique again as well. So here's an actual, a series of images of showing those two moons passing very close by one another again taken by the Cassini spacecraft so I hope you enjoyed that and apologies if it's very Saturn focused one of those reasons is that I've spent years and years looking at Saturn uh, that's what my research has mostly focused on but I do believe that it has some of the most dynamically interesting moon and ring systems so it's definitely worth looking at again this was not to look at the biggest moons the moon with the biggest atmosphere, or those sorts of things. It was my interesting top five dynamically. So thank you for watching. And if you have any questions or ideas for future videos, then just leave them below in the comments.